Greetings, it is I, Rakutar, and I have once again returned to bring you a Disney movie review. And since we are now in the spooky season, I thought I'd review what is quite possibly the scariest, spookiest, darkest Disney movie of them all. The Black Cauldron. Boo! What? Shadow figure? What are you doing here? I heard you say something along the lines of darkest Disney movie, so I thought I'd come along for the ride. And you know how I love dark things. But I thought you disappeared. Oh please, don't bore the audience with that long, irrelevant story. We're here to talk about a Disney movie, aren't we? Ah, uh, you're right. We don't want to lose our audience before the video has even begun. In fact, we're already taking our precious time. We better speed things along. I'm not sure I actually want you here. Oh, don't worry. I have a great idea. How about you review the movie, as you always review all your movies, picking apart what works and what doesn't work and all that boring business, and I'll talk about all the creepy, spooky parts. Hmm, I suppose that works. And you can keep track of just how dark the movie actually is, because... I've always questioned if this really is the darkest Disney movie or not. Everyone always claims that it is, but I've been a bit skeptical. Other movies like Pinocchio and The Hunchback of Notre Dame have always seemed a bit darker in my personal opinion, more so for their themes and ideas. But who knows, maybe this really is the darkest Disney movie. So how about we find out? One thing right at the beginning of the movie that's a bit creepy is how the Black Cauldron itself is actually a man that was so evil they turned him into into a cauldron. That'll definitely start the movie off with a few dark points. The Black Cauldron is a movie that I never really grew up with as a kid, and probably for obvious reasons. In fact, I doubt very many people at all grew up with this movie. There are probably several people still today who've never even seen it. And I'd heard lots of mixed things about the movie. Some people who loved it, and some people who absolutely hated it and thought it was the worst Disney movie of all time. So I wasn't exactly sure what to think going in, but you know, that's probably a good thing, because you shouldn't really let the internet decide how good a movie is for you. Always think for yourself. Anyway, when I did actually watch the movie, I thought that it was okay, and I still pretty much agree with that. I think one reason why I've always just felt this movie was okay is the fact that the main character is not exactly great. Some people find him obnoxiously annoying, and he certainly has his annoying moments, I will admit. But I don't think he's the world's worst character or anything like that. I mean, he is just a kid, technically, so he is going to be a bit naive and immature. I think Tarin could have actually been a pretty decent character if his character arc wasn't so strange. Let me explain. Tarin is immediately established as being a dreamer of sorts, who wants to hit the big time and become a great and honored knight. But he clearly doesn't really know what that actually means, or what it takes to actually become a great knight. Essentially, he just wants the reward without any of the work, and thinks that just wanting something will actually get him that thing, which is actually a pretty good starting point for a character arc. I also like that his ambitious dreaming causes him to fail at his job, which is currently taking care of the pig. And by the way, I really don't care for the pig. It's a bit of a plot device, actually. And honestly, the idea of a magical pig that makes water show you visions is kind of a bit dumb, you know? But I guess it doesn't take up that much of screen time, technically, so I can't get too mad at it. Anyways, back to Tarin. His failures to watch the pig eventually leads him to meeting what is my personal pick, though, for the actual worst character in this movie, Gurgi, or as I like to refer to him, Discount Gollum. Oh, master, master. Now, Gurgi remembers, yes, yes. Gurgi is just kind of annoying. The movie clearly wants you to think that he's funny and adorable, but uh, he's not. He spends half the movie harassing the main characters and trying to get them to give him stuff, or just taking it by force, and he spends the other half of the movie acting all nice and cuddly. Oh, isn't he so precious? No! He is a filthy liar. We've seen what he can do. How am I supposed to trust that he actually cares about any of these people? You horrible, greedy thing. You should be ashamed of yourself. Shortly after this encounter, things take a turn for the worse, as the pig is taken. I should like to mention that when the pig is captured, these dragon thingies are a bit scary as well, so a few dark points for them. I kind of find this scene a bit hilarious, where Tarin looks up at the intimidating castle, preparing himself to head out to save the pig, and then Gurgi shows up and he's like, 
Won't he come back to be your friend? I'm just thinking, what have you done to actually be his friend? Torrin also calls him out on this nonsense. How does harassing someone for an apple count as becoming their friend? Even though Torrin heads out to the castle on his own, brushing off Gurgi, and rightfully so. Friend? You're no friend. Gurgi genuinely thinks that he somehow is Torrin's friend. Like this genuinely upsets him. I don't understand it. Mercifully, Gurgi isn't actually present for the next half hour or so of the movie. So we can thankfully put him away in the corner for a little bit and focus on what is actually probably my favorite part of the movie. Since you're probably starting to think, how come you said this movie's okay if all you've done is complain about it so far? That's because we haven't got to the actually good stuff yet, my friends. Actually, on the subject of what I do like in this movie, before I talk about what happens next, I want to take a moment to just explain my favorite aspect of the entire movie, which isn't any particular scene, but something that's consistent throughout, and that is the animation and atmosphere of the movie. I guess that's technically two things, but they're kind of in the same category, if you ask me, since the atmosphere kind of relies on the animation. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is, this is once more, and I feel like I say this in all my Disney animation videos, one of Disney's best-looking movies. And unlike some of their other best looking movies, this one gets absolutely no credit whatsoever. Even less than something like The Rescuers Down Under. Whereas in that case, people will at least say oh, the bird scene was pretty good. But here I never hear anyone except a few people who ever mention that this is one of Disney's best looking movies. I mean, just a few releases ago in Disney's timeline, they were still using that scratchy animation look. And even the movie just before this, The Fox and the Hound, doesn't look anywhere near as good as this one. Plus I do tend to give more credit to movies that are primarily about human characters and not animal characters since they're generally a bit harder to animate. But that's just half of the puzzle. The other thing I mentioned, that being the atmosphere, is absolutely incredible in this movie. This is one of the most immersive Disney movies ever made. They've done such a magnificent job bringing this dark, mysterious fantasy world to life. Whether it be the thick forests, the jagged mountains, the dark castles, the murky swamps, or even a magical hidden land underground. Every location in this movie is so atmospheric and immersive that even when the characters aren't exactly particularly thrilling, you're still engaged in the experience because you care about seeing this interesting world on display. I would also like to add a few dark points in that category, as the movie is quite literally dark throughout. There's barely any sunshine to be seen, and that is the way I prefer it. Not to mention the tone of the movie is quite depressing as well. So little hope. It's pure glee to watch the characters struggle through these dark situations. <laughs> and now with that out of the way, back to the dark castle. Inside the castle, we finally get introduced to the villains of this story. Well, technically there was a scene with the Horned King previously that I skipped over, but this is technically where he was actually supposed to first appear before, well, a very long story's worth of behind the scenes issues. Anyways, before I actually talk about the Horned King, I want to first talk about Creeper, his second in command, I guess? Or just assistant, or whatever he is. The only other villain with a name in this movie. Surprisingly, the first character I'd actually call great. You know, not who you'd expect, but hey, that's how it is. He actually brings a bit of comedy to this movie for once. I'm assuming that Gurgi was supposed to be comedic when he showed up, but uh, he's not. Creeper, on the other hand, actually is funny. Especially whenever he makes some sort of mistake and the Horned King grabs him and chokes him. Iconic stuff. Most iconic of all, though, when he's so afraid of being choked choked, that he chokes himself instead. But of course, I'd be lying if I said I preferred Creeper to the Horned King himself, who's uh, arguably an even better character. I mean, he doesn't really have that much in terms of characterization. He basically just wants to take over the world and rule with an army of the dead, you know, not exactly very deep. But what he lacks in depth, he makes up for in sheer terror. This is by far Disney's scariest villain, except for that two second clip with the coachman in Pinocchio. I mean, just look at his design here. 
he borders somewhere in between human and skeletal. Definitely more so on the skeletal side, but the fact that he sort of still has a little bit of skin clinging to his bones that's a bit greenish, like it's fading over time. Quite disturbing, actually. And just those empty eye sockets of nothingness. And then whenever we do see his eyes, they're just these piercing red dots of evil. I love the simplicity of his outfit, too. Just a simple red robe with a hood, and his two terrifying horns twisting up through his hood. An S-tier design, my friends, which we will certainly never see again in a Disney movie because they would never in their lives dream of making something this scary in one of their movies ever again. You're certainly right about the Horned King's terrifying design. I'll have to add a few points for how dark that is to my calculations. And not to mention his whole goal of raising an army of the dead is definitely a bit further than most Disney villains would go. And though I mentioned that the Horned King isn't exactly a deep character with deep motivations, I don't really care that much because this story isn't really that deep in general. It's meant to be more scary than it is supposed to be intriguing or clever or any of those words. But one bit of characterization the Horned King does have that I really like is this implication that he is basically almost one. I mean, assumedly, someone else owned this castle before he came along and he uh, killed them all. It's probably why there's all those skeletons skeletons in the basement, and everyone dreads him and fears him, that if he were to find the Black Cauldron, since he's seemingly already conquered a good portion of this world, as soon as he gets the Black Cauldron, it's over for whatever's left. You know, I think when it comes to it, the Horned King is probably even more powerful than Maleficent, who's the closest to other villain that I can think of that compares to him. Well, that's enough about the villains for now. Let's get back to old Pig Boy, eh? And for once, he actually receives a bit of character development in this castle portion of the movie, as Tarn is actually tested on the idea that he thinks he's such a great knight and could do all these great things. Of course, in reality, Tarn knows that he can't exactly go barging into the castle demanding his pig back, so he stealthily sneaks his way in... not exactly. He, he kind of messes up and literally falls right in front of the Horned King's face. I like how Tarin's true cowardice comes out here, as he almost gives the Horned King exactly what he wants. And though he's able to free the pig, he ends up getting captured in his place. And that might sound like some sort of noble sacrifice, but that wasn't exactly his plan. In fact, he's greatly upset by this. One of my favorite scenes in the whole movie, actually, is when Tarin is thrown into the dungeon, and he reflects upon all his ideas of being this great knight, and how much of a loser he actually really is, that he failed so badly and is now captured by this great villain who he was supposed to protect the pig from in the first place, not even knowing if the pig is truly safe. The only bad news is that the movie is about to pretend that none of that character development actually happened. Well, actually, first, let me talk about the next character who shows up. You know, this castle scene really likes to introduce a lot of characters, uh, that being Ilonwi. I'm Princess Ilonwi who some of you might know I already talked about in my Disney princess ranking. And yes, she technically is a Disney princess, even though Disney doesn't count her. I mean, she's in a Disney animated movie and is officially a princess, but you know, Disney likes to pretend this whole movie doesn't exist, so it's not really a surprise they don't count her. Though personally, I don't think it's too big of a loss as Ilanwi is never one of my favorite characters. Even amongst this movie's cast, she falls on the lower end, probably above Tarin though, personally. If just on the fact that her very first scene is her literally escaping from this castle all on her own, which I've always loved because of how opposite it is of the usual trope of a knight rescuing a damsel in distress. Instead, here we have the quote-unquote knight trapped in a cell while the princess comes and rescues him. Uh, sort of. Well, she doesn't really much rescue him as much as she does open up a passage and accidentally finds him there and just like, well, guess you can come along too. You know, I really don't actually have that much to say about Ilonwi. She's kind of a bit boring, not like horrifically boring or anything like that. I really feel that she was given the short end of the stick overall when it comes to this movie. While I prefer her to Tarin, I'd be lying if I said she was a more memorable character than Tarin. But anyways, uh, let's move on. Tarin finds this old magical sword and, well, this is unfortunately the beginning of his character ungrowth. As though it seemed he learned his lesson, he essentially just gets immediately rewarded with a magical sword out of nowhere that basically 
makes him into the true success he always wanted to be. So it really feels like he didn't learn anything and kind of just gets what he wanted anyways. Which is a bit of unfortunate writing, if you ask me. This is what I meant when I said his character development is frustrating. And what do you know? It's yet another new character introduced. But the good news is, it's actually another good character that's being introduced. Fluter Flam, who's definitely the best of the good guy characters in this movie. I'd be lying if I said he was some super deep, amazing character. He's really just the comic relief, and he's much better at it than whatever Gurgi was attempting to do. Fluter Flam's comedy comes from the fact that he thinks he's so great, but really he's not. But he's never like obnoxiously egotistical. It's more so that he tells himself he's great and tries to make himself believe it. But he also has this magical harp thing that always knows when he's lying. I have sung in some of the finest courts. <laughs> And if he lies a bit too much, it'll snap, which kind of gives away what he's saying is not exactly the truth. Out of all the characters in this movie, Fluter Flam's flaw is definitely the most believable. You forgot the best part about Fluter Flam's introduction. The dead minstrel hanging on the wall. It's truly hilarious. <laughs> yes, uh, whatever you say. So now our three, uh, heroes make their grand escape from the castle, thanks to the magical plot convenience sword. I love how even Fluter Flam is flabbergasted by this sword. Why didn't you tell me you had a magic sword? So anyways, next we get a scene of our characters bonding together and enjoying themselves. Oh wait, that's not what happens. Well, it is what was happening at first, but then, you know, everyone devolves into arguing with each other. What's kind of funny about this argument scene is it's actually supposed to be some sort of a romantic development between Ilonwi and Tarin. Then again, maybe that's pretty accurate to real life couples. Fluter Flam tries to put out the fires of war, but, you know, fails. And oh dear, it looks like Discount Gollum has returned. I'm sure we all knew Gurgi was going to come back eventually. No one introduced Produces a character like that near the beginning of the movie and then just forgets they exist. You know, there's only one real reason why Gurgi even exists in this movie, and well, uh, we'll get to that. Gurgi tries to make up for his misgivings in the past by telling them that he knows where the pig is, but then our gang of heroes gets sucked into a whirlpool. Yes, I'm not lying, that does happen. And inside the whirlpool exists a realm of fairies or something who live underground. I think they're called the Fair Folk if I remember correctly. This is probably the most Disney part of this Disney movie, if you know what I mean. Since I'd forgive you if you forgot that you were actually watching a Disney movie up until this point. But ironically, that's probably why it's my least favorite part of this movie, because I kind of like how un-Disney the rest of this Disney movie is. You know, I really don't have much to say about this part, actually. Some old cranky fairy guy, you know, teleports them to the swamps, and that's all I really care to talk about. Oh, and I guess the pig is alright, it gets teleported to safety, and we never see it again in the rest of the movie. Literally, don't care about the pig at all, and apparently neither does the movie. Well, anyways, the reason they go to this swamp is because that is where the Black Cauldron actually is, since this little fairy guy actually knows. And that, by the way, I almost forgot to mention, is the current main goal of our main characters. Previously, it was protect the pig, save the pig, escape the castle. But now it's, we gotta destroy this Black Cauldron or some evil skeleton guy might actually rule the world and destroy us all. A pretty big shift in priorities. But the Black Cauldron isn't just in a swamp. It's being protected by three witches, of whom I have mixed opinions on. On one hand, I really like how animated and crazy the witches are, and I like how they cleverly manipulate the main characters into believing they're going to give them what they want, only to pull the rug out from under their feet at the last second. I also kind of just like the twisted nature of the fact that they kind of just want to eat the main characters. Uh, but then you also have uh, uh, these scenes. But I suppose the good parts outweigh the bad parts, so I would say they're definitely some of the better characters in this movie. Better than Gurgi, Tarn, and Ilonwi, at least. It feels like ages since I've said anything in this video, but at last we've reached the witches so I can finally say something. I mean, they're not exactly that scary or particularly dark, but I guess some people might consider them so, so I'll add a few, just, just a few points for them. What is darker, though, that I prefer is the fact that they like to turn people into frogs. It sounds like a silly idea, but the way it plays out is actually pretty terrifying. Would you like to be turned into a frog, eh, Rockotar? I think it would suit you very well. 
And speaking of giving the main characters what they want, they find out that the only way to get something from the witches is to bargain for it. However, the only item worth enough value to the witches to trade for the Black Cauldron is the magical sword in which Tarin had found. On one hand, it's nice to sort of see him have a bit of character development for once and give up the one thing that made him into a great knight. But at the same time, it wasn't exactly his in the first place. He kind of just found it, so, you know. It kind of just comes off as, I borrowed this sword, uh, you can have it now. The Black Cauldron's more important. Truly the strangest character arc in cinema history. But anyways, they do get the cauldron. And I feel like we've reached a part where I can no longer not say anything about the deleted scenes of this movie. You see, I'm sure it's a fairly well-known story at this point, though some of you might not know, so I'll briefly explain it. Is that this movie went through one of the worst development cycles of all time. It took seven years to get made. And that's not just because they were taking their time to make it a perfect masterpiece. I mean, I'd surely be singing its praises a lot higher if that were the case. Although it was still set to be probably a pretty decent movie, and, and I still like the final product. But I mean, it would have been a little bit better. However, Disney chickened out at the last second and thought the movie was too dark and scary and started going crazy, cutting out scenes all willy-nilly. But the stupidest part is, they didn't just cut out the darkest and scariest scenes, they also cut out other random scenes throughout the movie, which really weren't even that dark or scary, and if anything were just basic character development scenes, or even plot important scenes. Which is probably why it feels like so many things don't have that impact, because a lot of important material was cut out in between. There are various videos you can see on this subject of missing deleted scenes, and it will really enlighten you as to how much this movie really was botched in the edit. The fact that it's still watchable and even decent in the final cut is nothing short of a miracle, but it pains me that this movie could have been even better. And the reason I bring up all this right now specifically is because this part is the scene that bothers me the most that it was cut. Because right after the gang gets the Black Cauldron, in the original version, the deleted scene, they immediately try to find any weapons they can to smash and break the cauldron apart to achieve their goal in order that the Horn King cannot actually get what he wants, only for the witches to reappear and laugh at them for their feeble attempt to destroy the cauldron. But in the actual movie, as soon as the cauldron appears, it immediately cuts to the witches laughing at their feeble attempt to break the cauldron apart, even though they didn't even try to break the cauldron apart. This line... doesn't really make that much sense without the part where they try to break the cauldron to pieces. And it's one of those stupid scenes where there was no reason to cut it. It was surely a few seconds at most, and would not have ruined the runtime. It wasn't scary or dark in the slightest, certainly not more so than other scenes in this movie. So why has it been cut out? And on top of all that, it was fully animated, as were probably at least half of the deleted scenes in this movie. You know what annoys me the most of all the deleted scenes, Rokotar? What? That they cut out the gruesome scene where the skeletons attack the soldiers and melt them to become part of their army with them. It would have been the greatest scene in the movie. A tragedy we lost it. Wow! I never would have guessed that. But in all honesty, I kind of would have liked to see that too. I say it's time we go to Disney and force them to release the extended cut. Hashtag restore the black cauldron. Anyway, where was I? Ah oh, yes, the witch is laughing at them for not being able to break the cauldron. You know, another one of my favorite scenes of the movie actually is after the witches depart and the main characters just slump down in sorrow and fear that all their mission has been for naught. And yet still, they manage to find a glimmer of hope in each other. That, even if they fail, at least they met each other along the way, and had this great adventure. This also sort of ties into the romance subplot, which is barely even a subplot, it's brought up like twice in this whole movie, between Tarin and Ilanwi. It's a little bit shoved in there, you know. I mean, not everyone has to fall in love. But anyhow, uh, the Horned King's minions show up and capture all of the gang while they're sitting around. At last we've reached the climax of the film, as our heroes are taken back to the Horned King's castle, but this time, he now has the cauldron with them. I really like the hopeless atmosphere of this finale. I like that the Horned King actually starts achieving his goal of bringing about his army of the dead, while our main characters can do nothing but watch while hanging on a wall. 
Ah, the scene where the dead skeletons march out. One of my favorites in the film, though it could have been better if they didn't cut out the precious deleted scenes. You know, the very idea of the skeletons killing just by touching you is pretty terrifying, so I'll also add a few bonus points for that. The Horn King gets so into watching his army of the dead go marching out to take over the world that he kind of forgets he even had prisoners in the first place. And Gurgi, who escaped uh, somehow, actually I can't remember, was he even caught in the first place? How did he escape? I don't know, I'll probably just play a clip. Anyways, our main characters manage to get themselves freed, but they know they can't just run and escape or else the Horned King will take over the world. Something must be done about the Black Cauldron. Unfortunately, the witches explained earlier that the Black Cauldron can only be destroyed by someone jumping into it and dying. And what's that? Tarin is about to make a noble sacrifice, giving up his life to save the world like a true knight? It looks like he's finally learned and grown as a person. Oh wait, never mind. Get out of jail free card Gurgi goes to sacrifice himself instead. And if I'm being honest, this is probably the best scene with Gurgi in the movie, as it finally actually sheds a bit of light on why he was so pushy before and wanted everyone to be his friend, because in reality he's actually been lonely all his life and believed that no one cared about him or loved him. Therefore, if he jumps into the cauldron, it won't matter as much compared to if it were someone else, since no one really actually cared for Gurgi. Wow, movie, you actually did something genuinely dark that wasn't just skeletons and atmosphere. I find it funny that you say this is the first moment of darkness in the movie Rakotar. I've clearly pointed out more points before that. Well, it's one of the only moments I consider dark on a deeper level. That's what I meant, really. Yes, and that is why I find it delicious. This scene will probably get the most points from me in the movie. If they'd kept in that deleted scene, it'd probably be the most, but this will have to do for the most of what was actually kept in the film. But unfortunately, it's not quite enough to actually make me care about Gurgi. So when he does jump into the cauldron, I'm just thinking in my mind. Good. But his sacrifice works, and the Horned King's army is stopped in its tracks. Of course, he is greatly upset by this, immediately pinning the blame on Creeper first, since he's usually the problem in these situations. But Creeper immediately redirects the blame to the prisoners as soon as they head back into the castle to find out what went wrong. So the Horned King tries to reverse this by throwing Tarn into the Black Cauldron to fulfill his wish again. Unfortunately, things don't exactly work out, and, uh, well, he he kinda gets sucked into the Black Cauldron instead of Tarin. And honestly, this death scene is pretty gruesome for a Disney movie. I know he's already mostly a skeleton, but I mean, that's technically his flesh being ripped off there, along with his bones being pulled apart. But you know, me being me, I kinda love how gruesome it is. It only really works since he's already a bit skeletal. But because he's such a big creep and you kinda wanted to see him die in the most gruesome way possible, it really works. You're certainly right about this Horned King death scene being great. It's also pretty gruesomely dark, and that's why I love it personally. But I guess his power was so strong, it causes the cauldron to overload or something. But that's mainly just so we can have an explosive finale, as all the characters rush to escape the castle. And oh look, is that a CGI boat I see? Fun fact, The Black Cauldron is the first Disney movie to use any CGI, with this boat right here being the first ever use of CGI. The more you know. So anyways, they escape to safety while the castle blows up. But alas, it is not a happy ending for them, since they're sad to see their friend Gurgi go, even though they only really just met him. But I mean, I guess it's still kind of sad. Anyways, the witches reappear one last time to take the cauldron back in return for the sword. Now seeing that, you know, it might actually be more powerful than the sword. And the main characters sure don't care much about the cauldron, especially since the only one who was really a threat to using it is gone now. And honestly, this actually is probably my favorite scene in the whole movie right here, where Fluter Flam finally gets to flex his muscles and do something important to the plot, even if it is saving Gurgi. But anyways... Do not stay your hand, uh, ladies. We never give anything away. <laughs> we bargain. We trade, remember? And instead of bargaining for the sword, they suggest that Gurgi be brought back. But the witches aren't convinced. 
I'm assuming they just couldn't care less like us about bringing Gurgi back. But I love how Fluterflam actually convinces them to do it. Playing into their ego. Convincing them that if they can't bring back Gurgi, then they're really not as powerful as they say they are and no one should listen to them. Forever discrediting them. So of course, in order to avoid their reputation being ruined, they accept this challenge and use all their power to restore Gurgi to our unfortunate displeasure. Unfortunately, due to the nature of Gurgi, resurrection, I'll have to reduce some points because it undoes one of the dark scenes of his sacrifice earlier, a very unfortunate turn of events. But I suppose the in-universe characters are happy and that's all that matters. So our happy group of unlikely heroes walks off into the sunset. And that brings me to my final point about what I like in this movie actually, and the thing that really pushes it over the edge into being good and not bad. As it really seems that I don't have too much to praise in this movie, but there's one thing that does repicture a bit of my complaints actually, which is this idea that the world isn't always saved by the nice guys, the pretty girls, and the silly comedic side characters. Well, okay, I guess Fluter Flam is still a silly comedic side character, but my point is, it's not always the cool people who save the day. Sometimes it's the losers. It actually makes for a really interesting story when you think about it that way. This is a story of desperate losers, not brave heroes. And I like that. In fact, in general, I just like how different this movie is from all of Disney's other movies, and that it was daring to do something that no other Disney movie ever tried. To make a dark movie about evil skeleton overlords and lame heroes who have to win the day despite being losers. It's actually a fairly gripping movie. Not a second of it is boring. And even though there's definitely some strange characterization on some characters, or a lack of characterization in general on others, that was never going to be this movie's point anyways. It was more about the experience, the atmosphere, the world, the spooks and the scares. And that's why I think The Black Cauldron is pretty decent. It's better than people give it credit for. And I think it deserves to be remembered more than it is. This is my personal favorite Disney movie, Rockotar, because I do believe it to be the darkest thing Disney has made. Perhaps there are certain moments of deeper darkness and themes in other movies such as Pinocchio and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, as you mentioned, but there's too much lovey-dovey silly stuff in those movies for my tastes. I prefer this. Hmm, I wonder what your least favorite Disney movie is. Could it possibly be... The Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh? No! Oh, disgusting! How dare you mention that name here! I'm revolted! I shall leave at once if you are about to discuss that monstrosity of a film. And we're better off without him. If you enjoyed this video, why don't you check out my previous Disney animation video about the rescuers down under, or you could check out whatever random video YouTube has decided to recommend over here. And make sure to leave a like below and a comment telling me your thoughts on the Black Cauldron. And most importantly of all, stay iconic!